Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around your the world. that we're here tonight, gathered in your presence, so we can learn, so we can hear, so we can assimilate from the wisdom coming from above. In that today you will implant your word in every heart, and what you teach us will make us live appropriately and properly in our lives in Jesus name we pray that you will bless every one of us expose your word here tonight in Jesus name we pray last week we learned from the word of God and wisdom for living and we heard of the necessity and the profit of wisdom in our lives. Today again, we're following up on what we learned last week. And we want to see the benefits of godly wisdom. We're looking at two chapters of the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, as we learned before, is a book filled with practical wisdom. The wisdom we need to live a life successfully here. Before we get into those chapters, and before we get into finding out how to have wisdom in our lives, we need to understand that the Bible presents with us, presents us with three kinds of wisdom in the Bible. And these three kinds have to be differentiated one, one within the other or from the other, so that we'll know the type of wisdom that God wants us to have. You know, if you've been studying the Bible, that there are things that come from the devil. And whatever it is, it may look nice, may look appropriate, may even seem as if that's the thing you're looking for. The thing that will benefit you about anything, whatever the name, whatever the look, that comes from the devil, is always injurious to our lives. Sometimes you'll find that, apart from things that come from the devil, there are things that originate from the human mind. And... These things are varied. Sometimes some of these things that come from human minds may do us some good. But never think that will do us good eternally. If it's coming only, mainly, totally, completely from man. But as a third kind, whatever comes from God, the way it looks may not look as if that thing is going to be beneficial. But if it's coming from God, whatever it is, it's always beneficial. The same thing as we consider wisdom. There is wisdom coming from the devil. And even though it is called wisdom, it destroys. It tears people apart. And it makes people to live lives that will make them regret eternally. Then there is wisdom coming from men. Sometimes these types of wisdom coming from men can do you some temporary good can do you some good in the life that now is, but ultimately and finally and eternally, it is not still beneficial. But the wisdom coming from above, the wisdom coming from God, is the type of wisdom we need, and that is what is referred to as godly wisdom. 
which is the reason we are here today to know more and learn more about the wisdom from above, godly wisdom. See the three kinds in the New Testament. James chapter 3 and verse 15. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. There is a type of satanic wisdom that ruins people's lives. But because it is called wisdom, there are people that will spend all their lives running after it, seeking after it, and operating that type of wisdom in their lives. But it's coming from the pitch. It's coming from the source of darkness. It's coming from the enemy of your soul. And that type of wisdom, you should avoid, you should reject, you should repent of if you have operated in such satanic wisdom before. The wisdom that descended not from above, but earthly, sensual, devilish. But then we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Here we're introduced to another source of wisdom, a different kind of wisdom that is man's wisdom, or the wisdom of men. Again, we need to understand that this kind of wisdom will not benefit us or profit us eternally. Because this type of wisdom is not something that is always sanctioned by God. In fact, with God, or in the sight of God, it is regarded as foolishness. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? The wisdom that is of this world, God has made foolish. Eternally, it will proclaim you as a foolish man or a foolish woman. And so, it should not be our goal, ultimately and finally, to seek after Number one, devilish wisdom. Number two, human wisdom. Now the third kind, the wisdom of God. In Second Corinthians chapter, in First Corinthians chapter two, verse six, how be it, we speak wisdom that among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. This talks about the third kind of wisdom. Godly wisdom. Divinely imparted wisdom. And this type of wisdom will help us in the world that now is and in the world that is to come. In your life, you would have recognized at different times your need of wisdom. There are situations that will arise in our lives that will determine, that will demand the exercise of wisdom in our lives. And many people who have spent years in the pursuit of earthly wisdom, human wisdom, they have recognized at the time of dire need that they lack true wisdom, godly wisdom. And only the word of God can offer us the true wisdom that we're reaching or seeking after. And today, as we look at two chapters of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 2 and chapter 3, we're going to look at four definite things. Number one, the pursuit after wisdom. Because the book of Proverbs has preserved for us that if we're going to have this godly wisdom, it must be sought after. You seek after that wisdom as you seek a gift from God. You seek something from the hand of God. It doesn't just come 
naturally or automatically. So, seek that wisdom. Two, preservation through wisdom. We learn from this passage that we are going to study that our lives will be preserved, our families will be preserved, and the things that God has given us, whatever they are, a ministry, a gift, a purpose in life, whatever it is, opportunities that God has given us, a job, things spiritual and things material, things relating to our personal lives and things relating to people around us, whatever the Lord has given us, there's only one way to preserve that thing. It is through godly wisdom. There are people that have lost great opportunities and they have lost great protection because of the lack of godly wisdom. We'll look at that when we come to the passage. Number three, we'll see profit through wisdom. We lose when we're foolish. A lot of things we lose. Things spiritual, things material, things secular, things that are of today, of this life, and things even relating to the world to come, we lose without godly wisdom. But we profit, we gain, we benefit as we operate in godly wisdom. Then, the closing part of the study, we we'll look at precepts and warnings. Let's go back to point one. Pursuit after wisdom. Proverbs chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart unto, unto understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice of understanding, if thou seek her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find knowledge the knowledge of God. Here Solomon addressed himself to my son. Solomon used that language in Proverbs, because as a king, he could refer to his own son, natural son. His own father taught him, before the father left him, before David left him, the father imparted to him the word that he needed to learn, he needed to know, so that he will operate in the appropriate way. Look at First Chronicles chapter 28 and verse, 20, verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts, if thou seek him, he will be found of thee. If thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Now his own father spoke to him and said, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father. Serve him. Search for him with all your heart. Seek for him with all your heart. And now, he passed that across and over to his own son, his natural son. And he said, my son, if you will receive my word, you must hide my commandments with thee. But the word was not only for his son in the natural, son in the family. We need to understand that in those days, kings were referred to as father. And therefore, the king will refer to all people under him as sons. And so, in addressing sons, he was addressing all the people that were under him. And so, the people that were in his jurisdiction, in his kingdom, he referred to them. And one by one, he focused attention on them and he said, My son, meaning children of Israel, this is what you need without this you will not be able to live a life that is profitable. So number two, we learn that was referring to all the children of Israel one by one. Not only that. You see, if you read the Bible very well, many years after David had died, there were people that were referred to as the sons of David. In fact, you will find in the New Testament, women being referred to as daughter of Abraham. 
you'll find in the New Testament a man being referred to as the son of Abraham. And so we learn that this passage talking about my son in Bible terminology, it also refers to people that come in later generations believing on God. You see, if a prophet had believed on God, if a king had believed on God, then the people that come in later generations, they will be referred to as the sons of Abraham. Do you remember that the New Testament says that we are of the seed of Abraham? Do you remember that even the Bible calls Jesus son of David? And so then we learn, all of us who are believers today, as you look back at people that have believed on the Lord before, they refer to us as sons. So in this passage, Solomon is talking to those who believe in the only true God. Talking to the people that believe in that same God. Saying, my son, you need this wisdom. This is how to have the wisdom. Receive and hide and incline your ear and thine heart unto the wisdom. Then we need to understand that preachers and pastors and apostles always refer to the people underneath their teaching as sons. Uh, Apostle Paul said, Timothy, my son in the faith. Paul the Apostle referred to the Corinthians as children, his own children. He said, even though you have 10,000 instructors, yet you have not many fathers, because according to the gospel, I have begotten you to the Lord. Referring to the Galatians, he said, I travail again until Christ be formed in you. Referring to them as his own children. And then you'll believe, you, you remember that John the Beloved referred to the people he wrote to, little children. Referring to them as his own children. And that they should take heed unto the things they were learning so that we'll not lose our reward. So then, it means that the preacher, the writer of this sacred writing, is referring to every one of us that have believed as son. Then he used four parallels. What I mean by that is that he said the same thing, but in different ways, four different ways, to emphasize to us the necessity of seeking that wisdom. Telling us that the wisdom doesn't just come ordinarily. Look at that verse 1 again. My son, now you know if you are born again, he's referring to you. Ultimately, you know that the word of God is coming from God. It may come through the pen of Moses. It may come through the writing of David. It may come through the alterations uh, through the utterances of Solomon. It may come through the vision of Isaiah. And it may come through the body of Amos. It may come through the proclamation of Paul or Peter. But ultimately, whatever we read in the word of God is coming from God. And so you take this coming from God. My son, God talking to you through Solomon. God talking to you through the inspired preacher. My son, if you are a child of God, if thou wilt receive my word. Hide my commandments with thee. He says, receive. Then he says, hide my commandments with thee. Then he says, incline thine ear unto wisdom. Then he says, apply thine heart to understanding. Four different ways of telling you that you need to make some effort in seeking this wisdom, in getting this wisdom. In verses 3 and 4, he looks at four parallels again. That is, he says the same thing. In four different ways again, yea, if thou criest after knowledge, then he says, and lifted up, lifted up thy voice for understanding. Then he says, and if thou seekest her as silver, then he says, and searchest for her as for he treasure. You see, Solomon knew, and God knew, and still knows today, that the heart of man is very lazy. We're generally relaxed thinking that the wisdom will come ordinarily, thinking that the knowledge and the understanding will come ordinarily. So he says, cry after it. Lift up thy voice for it. Seek that wisdom as silver. Search as for hidden treasure. You see what uh, pictures uh, Solomon was using? He looked at the child that was very, very hungry, and that child will cry his heart out. To get something that is needed. He says, cry after God like that until you have that knowledge and wisdom. 
he finds people that are subjects of the kingdom lifting up their voices to the king as judge to the king as the only giver he says just like those subjects will come to the king and they lift up their voice so that they can get their request lift up your voice like that he looks at traders that are seeking after wealth and riches and gold and silver and he says do you see after how at how those merchant men will seek after their treasures and will seek after their silver, seek after wisdom like that. He looks at the people that cultivate fields and farms and will dig very deep until they'll be able to see hidden treasure. He says, go ahead and dig deep like that. You see, he was telling the people that if they needed wisdom, and they do need wisdom, and we do need wisdom, that we must cry like little children after God. We must lift up our voices as if we were pleading against the adversary. We must seek as we seek silver, as traders will seek silver. And we must search as for hid treasures, if we're going to have the wisdom. Then it says in verse 5, Then shall thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for just is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the path of judgment and preserveth the ways of his saints. Then shall thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, and every good path. Here then, the inspired writer begins to tell us the attitude, the motive in our heart, if we're going to get the wisdom coming from above. He has told us to receive, to hide it in our heart, also to incline our ears, and also to apply our heart. Then he has told us to cry out for it like little children, lift up the voice like subjects in the kingdom, seek like a trader is seeking, and search like a farmer is searching for his treasure in the farm. Then he says, if you are seeking like that and you hope to get, you must have the right motive. Understand that it is the Lord that giveth the wisdom. But to what type of people will he give the wisdom? He says in verse 7, He lays up sound wisdom for the righteous. That means that we must examine our hearts and our lives. Why do I need that wisdom? To obey God. To go in the direction that God wants me to go. You remember when Solomon was asking for wisdom? He said, Lord, there's only one purpose for this. You made me a leader. You made me a king. In the place of my father David. And I'm ignorant. I'm foolish. I do not have the wisdom that I need. Therefore grant me wisdom and understanding. That I may know how to go out and come in among your people Israel. How to lead so great a people. A great multitude. You see that's the good purpose. He wanted it for the good of other people. He wanted it for the benefit of other people. You see if we're selfish. And we only want wisdom so that. We can be proud. God doesn't give it that way. But if we want wisdom, so we can be beneficial to other people, our lives will contribute to the lives of other people, then God will give. He gives it to the righteous, number one. He gives it to the upright, number two. He gives it to his saints, that's uh, verse eight. Gives it to those who are holy, righteous, upright, holy, or saintly. And verse 9, to those that will walk in every good path. You see, Solomon was uh, giving us all these parallels. Saying, number one, be righteous. Number two, be upright. Number three, be saintly or holy. Number four, make sure that you are good. You love every good path. If all those good motives are in your heart, then seek and search. And the Lord himself will give in Proverbs chapter 3 from verse 13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. Again, Solomon is reminding us here that as merchants and traders will seek out, give energy, give time, spend everything they have so that they'll be able to have the silver and the gold. Even so, those of us that do not have wisdom or enough wisdom now must seek and search 
Think about it. When a man starts trading in his life, he has only limited resources. But then he puts in energy. He puts in, he puts in time. He might have to put in some time to study, to search, to dig, to run around, and to exert himself. Then he begins to have more silver and more gold. And here is what the inspired writer is saying. He's saying to get money, we use the money we have. Put in time and energy to have wisdom. Use the wisdom you already have in the good direction. And plant your time, your resources, your energy, seeking after God so that you have what you don't have right now. And he says the gain and the benefit you have will be better and greater than the gain of gold and the gain of silver. In verse 15, she is more precious than rubies. Talking about wisdom. And all things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life. To them that lay hold upon her, her peace, everyone that retaineth her. Again, the writer is appealing to the life of the farmer. He goes to the farm, spends time, spends energy, and then he cultivates and is able to get the fruit out of the fruit-bearing tree. Then he brings the fruits home. Then he has to store them up. And it's in the storage that eventually the gain will come. And he says, this wisdom he, he was talking about is like a tree of life. And if the tree is just there in the garden of God, without you going there to the garden of God to pluck the fruits of wisdom, the wisdom will not be yours. We're still telling us again, like the farmer will give energy and time and bring the fruits home. So you must also go to God, the garden of God, the book of God, the congregation of the righteous, and also the presence of God in prayer, so that you'll be able to get the fruits of wisdom out of this tree of life. Then it says in verse 19, the Lord by wisdom has founded the earth. By understanding, he has established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down deep. He's saying that everything you can see, every beautiful thing around you that God has made, he did by wisdom. You want to make anything beautiful of your life? You need wisdom. You want to establish anything that is so standard and that is standing um, eternally as God has made, you need wisdom. You want your life to be so profitable that all the things you have made, even after so many years, it will still be seen like the earth that the Lord himself has founded. Then you need wisdom. By wisdom, the Lord founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. But then we must seek, we must search. Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. Verse 13. And ye shall seek me. And find me where you shall search for me with all your heart. That is, if we're going to have wisdom from the Lord, we must search with all our heart. You know, the general attitude of people is that they know that we must ask for salvation definitely with all our heart. They know that if we're seeking for salvation, we must not have any idol in the heart, any sin hidden in the heart, with the whole heart with all sincerity, with a good motive of benefiting from the work that Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, we seek after the Lord and get saved. You know that when we're seeking to be sanctified, it has to be with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. And it has to be with a pure motive. You know that if we're seeking for the baptism in the Holy Ghost, praying and seeking after the Lord, we cannot seek half-heartedly, but with all the heart. But then people do not know that the same earnestness, the same wholehearted desire, the same falling upon our knees and seeking the face of God must also go in the way of, um, in a way of prayer when we're seeking for wisdom. Whatever we're seeking the Lord for, for salvation or for wisdom, for sanctification or for understanding, whatever it is that we need to get from the Lord, seek with all your heart, wholeheartedly. In Matthew chapter 5, 
verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That shows us the attitude, the posture of the mind. If we're seeking after God, we need wisdom, be hungry for it, be thirsty for it. Then in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure, hid in a field. Do you remember that that's exactly the picture that we have read about in Proverbs? Seeking as for hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like unto the treasure hidden in a field which when a man has found, he hideth. And for the joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he has, and buyeth that field. In seeking God's wisdom, or godly wisdom, we might have to forsake things that stand in the way, things that contradict the wisdom of God, things that make use or take up our time unnecessarily, so that we can receive. In James chapter 1, Verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, and who can say that he doesn't lack wisdom? If any of you lack wisdom, the family man, does, don't we lack wisdom in dealing with our wives, our women, sisters? Don't we lack wisdom in relating with our husbands, in dealing with our children, children dealing with their parents, we who are workers and leaders in the church? Don't our hearts cry out for more wisdom as we lead other workers, supervise other workers, and make other workers do the work of the Lord? Do suppose who are members in the church, as we talk to people, and you present the gospel to them, and you find, don't, don't, doesn't your heart cry out for wisdom? And as you work in your place of work, under your boss, under your manager, under your directors, don't you sometimes feel the foolishness with which you speak as you employ people. Don't you sometimes find, if I could have more wisdom, I'll make those people to do more work? Don't you find sometimes, even when you write to people and you talk to people and you demand for things, how much wisdom we need? In dealing and relating with our in-laws, how much wisdom that we need in our social interaction between friend and friend? How much wisdom that we need? And even uh, in appearing before people, and um, also being able to stand before our enemies, how much wisdom that we need. Who can say that he doesn't lack wisdom in secular matters, or in social matters, or in spiritual matters? How we need so much wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. But we need to understand that we must search, we must seek. We must dig. We must lift up our voices. We must cry to the Lord. The search for hidden treasures has led many men to chop their way through to dense jungles, just looking for things material, or to cross perilous icy passes or oceans, to plunge into the depths of the ocean, risking their lives in many daring ventures so that they can have the treasures that this earth would offer them in trying to subdue the earth, cultivate and dig up the things that the believer hidden. In that same way, we shall search with diligence, with sacrifice, with consecration and commitment so that we can obtain godly wisdom hidden in the word of God, in the heart of God. Let's look at when we get this wisdom, what profit do we have? That is, how does it preserve us? Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 2. Preservation through wisdom. As we're opening that passage, Proverbs chapter 2, just listen to this. We live in a world that is full of satanic power. Satan himself is going up and down, to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And he's clever. We learned that yesterday. He's cunning. We learned that yesterday. Very, very subtle. We learned that yesterday. And if you are going to be able to overcome the devil, resist the devil, and live a successful life in spite of all that the devil is doing, 
You need a type of wisdom that goes beyond the wisdom in which Satan operates. We have men and women in this world that are full of evil. Evil motives, evil imagination, evil desires, evil plan against your life. And they will come in cleverness, in the wisdom that the devil and the world have given them. If you are going to be preserved from trouble, you'll need this wisdom coming from above. And you know, there are circumstances that just they go beyond your faculties, your reasoning. The circumstances may be in your family life, and it may be in the place of work. These circumstances may even be around you in the midst of believers. And if your life is going to be preserved, your property to be preserved, your family to be preserved, every gift and every good thing that God has given you to be preserved, you need the wisdom that we're talking about. Well, there are people that will try to talk you out of the blessing of God. There are people that will try to talk you out of the many things that God has given you in your life. And if you're going to have all those things preserved, you need the wisdom of God. Look at now Proverbs chapter 2 from verse 10. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. And I tell you that wisdom will preserve your uh, family more than money will. Can I tell you that wisdom will keep your children at home more than strength and force? Can I tell you that wisdom will preserve you in the position that you have attained to in your place of work more than your academic knowledge? Can I tell you that whatever you have got, wisdom will preserve those things in your life more than any other quality you can think about in your life? Discretion or wisdom shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the path of uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil, and delight in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked, and they, they forward in their paths. There are many injurious men all around. Every large city is filled with them. Every village is filled with paths of darkness, people of darkness, and you need the wisdom of God to preserve you, to protect you, to hide you away from all those people. Not only that, the Bible talks of women that will try to take every good thing you have got away from you. And you need the wisdom of God. Now, this is not just referring to men being kept away from women. Even you as a woman, you need to understand that there are wicked women that may get at you. But it is, we, it is wisdom that will keep you from strange women. It's not only when we talk about falling into immoral life that uh, we, we're careful about strange women. Uh, strange women can bring your business down, can, can make your family to totally be torn apart, and can of course get into your life and make your life to become useless. But it's the wisdom of God that will preserve you. Preservation through wisdom. Look at verse 16. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forsaketh the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, and her path unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life, that, they may, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous that is this wisdom we're talking about will preserve you from the wicked and then make you to be in the midst of the good men people that will bring goodness and greatness into your life that will make you to walk in the paths of the righteous for the upright shall dwell in the land the perfect shall remain in it but the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. In chapter 3 of Proverbs, still looking at preservation through wisdom. Verse 21, my son, again, the father talking to the son directly. Again, the king talking to the subject directly. Again, the king 
or the preacher or the prophet talking to generations to come that will believe in the same God. Again, the preacher talking to the people that have believed the word of God through his preaching. My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Now here, the writer is saying, Sometimes the wisdom we get is like the dew of the morning. We get it, the sun rises up, and everything is evaporated away. Circumstances come, everything is taken away. And then we seem to be as foolish as ever. Do you know there are, some, there are times that we manifest wisdom? Oh, we say, how did I come out of that net? How did I come out of that problem? How did I get that preservation? That wisdom just came and I just manifested it. And yet the second day, the second week, the second month, everything has evaporated away. Similar circumstances come or different circumstances come and we do not have that wisdom anymore. And so he's saying, my son, get it and keep it. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. What does that mean? It will preserve you from death. It will be life to your soul. It will preserve you from shame. It is grace unto thy neck. Then shall thou walk in the way safely. It will preserve you from destruction. And thy foot shall not stumble. It will preserve you from falling. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down. Thy sleep shall be sweet just by getting wisdom and keeping wisdom. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. And then in Proverbs chapter 19 verse 8. He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. Chapter 22, verse 3. A prudent man. A wise man. A man that has sought after God for wisdom and has got it and is using it. Foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple, the foolish, the people that lack wisdom, they pass on and they are punished. It's telling us that we avoid many, many dangers in life if we have wisdom. In fact, the wisdom will make you to foresee. You are planning something, you see the dangers ahead of that plan. You are building up something, you see the possible destruction ahead of that building. And there is something that you are imagining and wanting to do in your life, you foresee the evil ahead. You foresee the difficulties and the dangers ahead. And the wisdom of God makes you to hide yourself so that you are preserved. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 9, from verse 13. This wisdom have I seen also under the sun. And it seemed great unto me. There was a little city, and few men within it. And there came a great king against it, and besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered the same poor man. Here Solomon again is telling us that people do not appreciate wisdom the way they ought to. People do not look up to wisdom the way they ought to. Let me just remind you of the difference between David and Solomon. David was a warrior. He had weapons of war. He had strength and he had ability to fight. On the other hand, Solomon was not a great fighter. Solomon was not a warrior. And Solomon did not make use of weapons of war like his father. But can I remind you that Solomon had more peace in his kingdom than David. And when Solomon looked at all that, he said, Wisdom is better than weapons of war. He didn't do too much fighting. And yet, there was peace. There was prosperity because the wisdom kept him. In fact, instead of the kings around fighting against him, they were coming to him seeking his wisdom. And so you need to know in your life that 
it's not just that you have ability to fight, ability to be able to contend, ability to defend yourself, but the wisdom in your life, it will make you get beyond the people that fight for themselves, the people that defend themselves. And here Solomon said, there was a little city, few men in it, and there was a poor man there. The man didn't have money, but he had wisdom. The man did not have the wealth, the riches of this world, but he had wisdom. The man did not have the weapons of war, but he had wisdom. And he said, a great king, having many soldiers. A great king, having many subjects that will fight behind him. Besieged that little city. And this poor wise man, by wisdom, he delivered that city. What's the conclusion? In verse 16, then said high, wisdom is better than strength. I found people that will try every means possible to develop their strength, to build up their muscles. But it says, if you are building up your muscle, that's all right, but then get wisdom, because wisdom is better than strength. It said in verse 18, wisdom is better than weapons of war. There are people that try to know how to defend themselves, but you know, wisdom is better than weapons of war. And so, we learn here that wisdom is very, very essential. Matthew chapter 22, preservation through wisdom. Matthew chapter 22, from verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his thought. And they sent out unto him their disciples with their audience, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of man. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? You see, many of us cannot stand flattery, praise, honor from men. And if people come to us, and they start by praising us, we do not have the wisdom to detect that the praise is not genuine. We fall before anybody that will flatter. We fall before anybody that will praise us. Because we do not have the wisdom that we ought to have. But wisdom will protect you and preserve you. Jesus, because he operated in divine wisdom, he operated in godly wisdom, he knew that flattery coming from Herodians will not be genuine. You see, it's the wisdom of God that makes you to understand that if somebody is not born again, all that uh, praise, all that honor cannot be from the death of the heart. Until the heart is changed, an Herodian will flatter, not sincere praise. Until the heart is born again, a Pharisee will flatter. It cannot be genuine praise. So once you know that in the wisdom of God, that sinners, unbelievers, backsliders, those who are the grace of God before, but today they do not have the grace of God, the, a, a sinner does not appreciate anybody. His pride will not allow him to appreciate anyone. And so you will understand, that's just flattery. And so Jesus knew because the praises coming from unbelievers, from Herodians and from Pharisees cannot be genuine. That's wisdom in itself. And so we're told in verse 18, But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Jesus knew that the Herodians and the, and the Pharisees were just politicians. And those people, with, because their hearts were full of politics, there was no way they could really have real praise and sincere uh, appreciation for the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that it was just their political type of tactics. And he said, show me the tribute money. And he brought unto him a penny. And he says unto them, whose is this image or superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these, these words, they marveled, they left him and went their way. You know what he did? It preserved Jesus' ministry at that time. It preserved Jesus' life at that time. Because 
He wasn't going to die before his time. And he wasn't going to die before he appeared on the cross of Calvary to die for our sins. He wasn't going to fall to the platters. And so our lives will be preserved and prolonged through the use of godly wisdom. The nearer we are to God, the more wisdom we'll have. The more we fellowship with God and pray to God, the more, the more wisdom we'll have. And the more we read and study the Bible, God's manual of practical wisdom, the more wisdom we're going to have. Kings and kingdoms have been preserved only by wisdom. Preachers and churches have grown only by godly wisdom. Men and communities have prospered only by godly wisdom. Women and their families have been preserved only by divinely imparted wisdom. And this is made available to those believers who will be diligent. Now, profit through wisdom. Proverbs chapter 3, from verse 1 to verse 10. Here now, we're told again, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Remember, those commandments were given out in wisdom. In fact, the Bible says that the word of God is the wisdom of God. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Length of days, long life, peace shall they add to thee. You see, when you operate in godly wisdom, godly wisdom has the quality of prolonging your life and giving you peace. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the tables, the table of thine heart. So shall thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. You obey the commandments of God, you operate in divine wisdom, then you'll have favor with God. Let me ask you, what made Abraham have answers to prayer that he had just because he spoke words? No. You'll find there was great wisdom in what Abraham said unto God. When he was praying about Sodom and Gomorrah, he started with, suppose you see 50 people there. And then he appealed to God, I'm only dust and ashes. Suppose you find 40 people there. Lord, do not be offended at me, but I will speak. Uh, you, are the, you are a righteous God and a just God. Suppose you find 30 people there. Oh Lord, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Suppose you find 20 people there. Oh Lord, I know that I'm not qualified to be talking to you, but shall we, will you destroy these people? Suppose you find 10 people there, apart from the prayer, apart from the faith within the prayer, you can see the wisdom there. Can you see the wisdom in the prayer of Moses? Oh Lord, you want to destroy these people? The Egyptians were here. They're going to think you are not able to take them to the land of Canaan. Oh Lord, in this judgment, remember mercy. Can you find the wisdom of God right there? Can you find the wisdom of God in uh, Joshua's prayer? Oh God, what will I do? When the children of Israel, when they turn back from their enemies, and all these people that encamp around us here, when they say that God has forsaken us, and they run at us, and they wipe out the descendants of Abraham, what are we going to do? Can you find wisdom there? Can you find the Gibeonites? who had come with cunning, with uh, cleverness. And then Joshua had promised them, it's all right, that uh, we'll preserve your life. They thought they, they came to them. And when they came to them, they said, so you are neighbors? Oh yes, we're afraid that you'll kill us. That's why we came. What are we going to do now? Already they were in a problem. If they killed those people because of the covenant they had made, a judgment will come upon them. But then they said, we'll not kill you. You'll be, coming, you'll be drawing water and cutting wood and become servants for the children of Israel. Can you see wisdom there? Can you see wisdom in David when he was uh, with Saul? And then Jonathan. Can you see that wisdom preserved his life? Can you see when Absalom drove him away from the throne? And Ahithophel, the greatest of all counselors that had been with David, was with Absalom. And then there was a counselor, a wise man, that was with David. And David said, don't follow after me. Go to my son Absalom. 
because anything they are saying, you just tell them you are going to advise them. Advise them to my profit and then be sending information to me so that I will know what they are doing. Can you see that is why that is how David did not die at that time? I'm telling you that when you have godly wisdom, it gives you favor with God, favor with man. It preserves your life. It's profitable to have wisdom. But you know, if we're just going through life, a manager, a director, a believer, you know that the devil is targeting you. You know that evil men are targeting you. You know that all the people of this world, the people that do not have the grace of God in their heart, they target you. And yet, no wisdom. We need wisdom. Profit, a lot of profit comes through wisdom. It gives us favor with God and favor with man. In verse 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thine own eyes. That is, do not be satisfied with just human wisdom. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy bands be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. And now the chapter uh, continues with precepts and warnings. We'll see pursuit after wisdom. We'll see preservation through wisdom. We'll see profit through wisdom. And we've learned. The Lord, through all these passages, now the precepts and the warning. Verses 11 and 12. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. <coughs> For whom the Lord loveth, he corrected, even as a father the son, in whom he delighted. Remember that all we're reading is still about wisdom. And he's telling us how some people become foolish in life. Correction is something that is not convenient for the flesh. But think about a child that has been corrected by the father at home. And early in life, that child ran away from the family because of correction. Is that wisdom or foolishness? Foolishness. That child will not be able to grow up properly in life later. Think about a child at school. The teachers, the principals, they correct that child. And that child will run away from school because of the correction, because of the reproof. Is that wisdom or foolishness? That's foolishness. Think about a church that God corrects and repeals and reproves and chastises his child. Maybe through the pastor. Maybe through other people. Now, after that chastisement or discipline, that person runs away. Is that foolishness or wisdom? That's foolishness. And so in the wisdom of God, we are being told, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. If you have wisdom, you interpret that correction, you interpret that chastisement as the love of God putting you aright. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrected as a father the son in whom he delighted, in Hebrews chapter 12. Reading from verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. You know, many times uh, we do not appreciate, we do not embrace, we do not enjoy or love the correction, the reproof, the chastisement of the Lord. But he says, wisdom will make you to embrace it, will make you to accept it, will make you to love it. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had the fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present 
for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. That is, rebuke is not appropriate for the flesh. It's not nice to the man. It, we don't enjoy it. But it is wisdom that will make us to understand that that is medicine to my soul. That will make us to understand that thing will develop me. Make me the right person that I ought to be. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. So the wisdom of God is directing us. That when correction comes, when chastisement comes, when discipline comes, we should love it, embrace it, and just praise the Lord for it, and see what the Lord will want us to get through that. Then in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not to thy neighbor, Go and come again, and tomorrow I will give thee, when thou hast it by thee. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Here Solomon was saying that you'll come across situations in life where you know that you ought to do good. He's talking about sharing your food with the hungry. Sharing your clothes with the naked. Giving water to those who are thirsty. Giving shelter to those who are left outside. And he's saying, when you do that, you are doing good. So that the people do not die of hunger. They do not die of cold. They do not die of nakedness. They do not die of thirst. They do not die of some needs in their lives. That you do good. Isn't that what Jesus said? That give and it shall be given unto you. It is foolishness to withhold what we have from other people. It is foolishness and selfishness when we do not share. But it is wisdom when we share. There is he that scattereth and increases. That is wisdom. There is one that withholdeth more than his meat and it comes to poverty. You see in the foolishness of man, we think I must withhold. I must keep what I have to myself. I must not share with anybody. The word of God says that is foolishness. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together. Running over. Shall men put in your bosom. And then he says, He that giveth to the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he has given shall be repaid him again. So withhold not good for them from him it is due. But understand, apart from the natural bread, there is the bread of life, the word of God. Apart from the natural water, there is the water of life, the message of salvation. There is the gospel. And you, after you have been saved and you are born again, you have the gospel. That's the greatest thing that you can give to your neighbor. The greatest thing you can share with your neighbor. Withhold not that good message of salvation. Withhold not that good news of salvation. Withhold not that gospel of eternal life from them who are sinners, from whom it is due. From the sinners that Jesus died for on the cross of Calvary, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. When you've got the opportunity, you're sitting with that individual, you're living with that individual, or you're moving on with that individual, give out the gospel. Withhold not good from them that are with you. Because if you do, if you do not share, that will be foolish on your part. Say not to your neighbor, I'll give you tomorrow. Share that bread of life now. Give that water of life now. Don't say go and come again, then I will cancel you. Go and come again, then I will pray with you. Go and come again, then I will lead you to the Savior. Do it now, while it is in the power of your hand to do it. In James chapter 4 verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Somebody is dying of hunger, you have bread, give him. To him that knoweth to do good, feeding the hungry, and he doesn't do it, that's sin. Somebody is dying of thirst and you have water, give him just a cup of water. Or do you, you say, is there any reward for that? Jesus said, verily I say unto you, he that giveth a cup of cold water to a prophet in the name of a prophet, he shall not lose his reward. To him that knoweth to do good, giving water to the thirsty and doeth it not, to him it is sin. When somebody has been naked, clothe him. 
He said, I was naked and ye clothed me. And the righteous will ask him, when did we see you naked and we clothed you? He said, in as much as you clothed one of these little ones, you have done it for me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you visited me. When did, you see, when did we see you sick and in prison and visited you? In as much as you have done it for one of these little ones, you have done it for me. And also you find that somebody needs the gospel. You are born again. He needs to be born again. You are saved. He needs to be saved. Then give him the gospel. If you don't, then you are sinning. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Come back to him. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 30. Strive not with a man without cause, if he had done thee no harm. And be thou not the oppressor. Choose none of his ways. For the forward is abomination to the Lord. And his secret is, but his secret is with the righteous. Here the Lord is calling us to a life of peace. Don't strive. Don't fight. Your words must be peaceful between husband and wife, between children and teachers and parents, between believers and believers together. Our words must be words of peace. No strife, no fighting, no quarreling. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. It's talking about Christ and then talking about the Christian too. Beloved, behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive, nor cry. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the street. A bruised reed, shall he not break? Smoking plaques, shall he not quench? Till he send forth judgment unto victory. As a child of God, you are never an instrument of discouragement for anybody. Smoking uh, flask, you will not quench. A broken reed, you will not break. You are always an encouragement to people. To those who are suffering, you lift them up. To those who are confused, you comfort them. You are always a peacemaker. And you never strive, you never bring anybody into a position of downfall. In Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In Proverbs chapter 3, from verse 33, here now the chapter is concluded with warning that there is judgment for the people that will not be obedient to the Lord. The cause of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but the blessing, but he blesses the habitation of the judge. Surely he scorneth the scorner, but he giveth grace to the lowly. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. What the word of God is telling us is that we shouldn't deceive ourselves. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that he will reap. If you seek after knowledge, cry after wisdom, and search for wisdom, and you pray in faith, asking for wisdom, then the Lord will abundantly bless your life, and there will be great profit as a result of the wisdom. But if you forsake the Lord and forsake the word of the Lord, Forsake the commandments of the Lord. He says, He that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let's rise up and pray.